Hello, everybody. We would like to conclude this week with a bit of history. As mentioned already in the previous lecture, density functional was not uh, suddenly born from Hoenberg et Kohn. Ideas, attempts, and promising approaches were already known in the 60s, even if it took someone like Walter Kohn to formalize and start this ever-developing research line, as we will see. We want to give now a little and brief insight on the steps that took to the creation of density functional theory. Our story begins in Cambridge, at the Trinity College. Well, some years ago. We are in the 20s, at the dawn of quantum mechanics, in Ralph Fowler's group. Fowler, we can spot him towering among Heisenberg and Brillouin in this memorable photo, was an excellent scientist and teacher. He had supervised three Nobel Prizes. Incidentally, he was also the son-in-law of another great scientist and teacher, Ernest Rutherford, for having married his only daughter. So, we are in 1924, and Fowler has, in particular, three PhD students, from youngest to oldest, Huavelin Thomas, Paul Dirac, and Douglas Hartley. And while there is no need to explain and recount the achievement of uh, Paul Dirac, notably for the birth of quantum mechanics, we can safely consider Thomas and Hartree as real pioneers in the domain of density function. They gave, in fact, crucial contribution to the description of the electronic structure of atoms. Let's start from the youngest lad, Huabellin Hilleth Thomas. Thomas started his thesis in 1924, exactly when his advisor was taking a sabbatical in Copenhagen to work with Bohr. With Fowler away, Thomas start started studying a problem inherent to the old quantum theory of Bohr. It was in this domain that Thomas published his very first article, and in which indeed we can find the germ of the basic idea of density functional. Let's see. An extended form of Kronecker's theorem with an application which shows that Berger's theorem on adiabatic invariance is statistically true for an assembly. Now, I challenge any of you in finding in this title a possible connection with density functional theory. To understand this, we have to take a step back and consider what was, at that time, the state of the art of the description of atomic spectra, the Bohr-Sommerfeld theory for an atom. Here they are, by the way. Now, you might remember, following Bohr and Sommerfeld, that the energy and the angular momentum of the electrons are quantized, which, in their language, meant well-defined orbits for the electrons, like here for the inner orbit, for n equals 1 and l equals 0, the second shell, n2, l1, and n2, l0, and so on for n equals 3, etc. Let's write down the formula. The difference between the principal and azimuthal quantum number is given by the integral of this function that contains the potential felt by electron, in this case, the central potential plus the centripetal term, and the energy of the orbit. The span between R0 and R1, the extreme ready of the orbit. The question is, how is the Bohr-Sommerfeld formula of the atom connected with the Thomas paper. So let's start by focus on the term adiabatic invariance. You see that on the left of the formula, we have an integer number that has to stay integer for small variation of the potential, if we want to maintain the concept of orbits. Adiabatic changes should not alter the quantum numbers, which are then invariants. So the research about the adiabatic invariants and their conditions was a crucial topic at the dawn of quantum mechanics, for the very sake of the concept of stationary states. What Thomas was able to show with this theorem is that the quantum conditions are indeed adiabatic invariants in a statistical sense for an assembly. As he writes, the change in the integrand can be made as small as we like if we have an assembly in number such as the state can be represented by a continuous density in phase space. Essentially, Bohr's orbit fill up phase space uniformly. Where does this take us? Well, first of all, let's see where this took Thomas. You remember, Fowler, his advisor, was in Copenhagen at that time, and it has been arranged for Thomas to do his second year, 1926, in Copenhagen, with Fowler and Bohr, but also with Dirac, Kramers, 
Heisenberg, Pauli, and this was indeed Thomas's most productive year, but not how you would expect. In spite of the exciting environment towards the creation of the new quantum mechanics, Thomas worked hard on his problem about atomic fields and Bohr's orbits. For his own admission, the new ideas of quantum mechanics were not appealing very much to young Thomas. As he said, I was always slow in accepting new ideas and understood nothing of this for four or five years. But as I said, 1926 was an absolute productive year. Let me mention at least one of his most important achievements, the Thomas precession factor one half, in which, thanks to the lecture of Arthur Eddington followed in Cambridge, Thomas applied the same relativistic correction of the moon's motion to the motion of an electron with spin, managing in once to give the correct formula for the angular velocity and to reconcile with the anomalous Zeeman effect. Not bad for an intense week of work just before Christmas. But let's get back to the atom fields. We have seen that thanks to Thomas' theorem on adiabatic invariance, Bohr orbits are filled uniformly in phase space. And the filling rate is two electrons in every phase space volume h cube. So the electron density, n of r, in a sphere of radius r is given by 2 over h cube times the volume of the sphere in phase space. This is of course OK only in a uniform density. But Thomas assumed that the formula can be used locally even in case of non-uniform density. Here, Pf is the momentum of the highest, highest energy electron. Today we would call it the Fermi momentum. And its energy would be equal to the kinetic energy plus the potential energy. If now we consider that the potential is given uniquely by the electron density, by the Poisson equation, we can close this set of equations to have the final formula for the potential felt by electron of an atom. This is the Thomas Fermi equation. Enrico Fermi independently arrived from a statistical point of view to the same equation. In the next videos, we will see the theoretical limitation of such an approach and, above all, the connection with density functional. But here, let me conclude highlighting some important points. First of all, it is already well clear that the electron density is considered as the crucial quantity. Second, we have a simple equation to solve. Sure, the Thomas Fermi equation is a nonlinear ordinary differential equation, but works in one radial dimension or the three spatial dimensions, and not in the three n dimensions of the Schrodinger equation. So it is much simpler. Finally, let me mention two things that we have seen and will play an enormously important role in density functional theory. The concept of local approximation, something that should be true only in a uniform density, we assume to be locally true also for non-uniform densities, and a germ of cell consistency. So we stop here for the moment, don't miss the second part. Goodbye.